I, I would never, I would never ever change my journey for nothing, absolutely nothing. Because what it's taught me, what it's uh, the player that I've became, the person that I've became. If someone was to to give me a crystal ball, I'd have chosen that path simply because there's rejection, there's adulation, there's success, there's absolute heartache along the way, and that's that's an emotion that's. That makes you a better person going forward. I would never change anything about my career. <clears throat> well, first of all, with, with Falkirk, looking back, I, you know, I was extremely lucky because there was no money at Falkirk. So yeah. you had to promote within. So you had to you had to bring these players through the system. So our under-19s, 21s team was effectively 11 of us then went into the first team because you have to promote oh, wow. within. So what an opportunity we had. And it was maybe five or six that had careers out with that, good ones, bad ones, short ones. Obviously, mine was, was long term, still 35 and playing, but it was so lucky to look at back at that. And a manager that was so interested in promoting youth and gave, gave youth the chance. Right. So that was that was incredible. And then, obviously, it comes to the time where you have to move on, 21, 22. That's when you moved to Huddersfield. Yeah, I think it was, it might have been 20 actually, yeah. Um, and the time was right. The time was right to move on at that time. I read, I read somewhere that that there were opportunities to go to, to other clubs. Southampton, I think, yeah. was, was a club that was mentioned. Yeah. Were they in the Premier League at the time? Yeah, they were, yeah. So yeah. what happened there? But I don't, know, I don't know how far that went down the line. Mm. You know, I, I got asked about it, but I don't know whether it actually came to the club to Falkirk to actually accept the bid. Right. I've never, ever asked that question. But it was the right time to move on, and I wanted to move on. I wanted to progress. Uh, the time at Huddersfield never went as smooth and as good as what it could have done, probably. And... To be honest, as you get older, you look back at things that you've that you've done, and I contributed massively to that right. factor of my lifestyle, and the, de the decisions I was choosing oh, to do we're at that get time. Into that of in course, a yeah. Well, at the, at the time, <clears throat> growing up in Livingston, my full journey was to escape Scottish football. So I wanted to get to England as quickly as possible. And why is that? <clears throat> One, to test yourself, mm -hmm. and two, obviously it's financial gain to get down there and try and look after your family. But the lure of playing against the best players. And there's there's different there's different sides of that. Obviously, you can you can light it up in Scotland, and then you could maybe go to a top ten prem, or you go the same journey as what I did, which is which is more um, more common for the player, because in England they sort of look down at Scottish football, right. so it's it's very rare that you go to one of the top teams or one of the the most prestigious teams. Um, and when I got that opportunity to go to League One, that was a that was my that was my chance. And obviously, like we spoke about there, and lifestyle wise, and um, you know, I was just doing things and, and going out at times and enjoying my enjoying my, my youth probably more so than what I did. And then once once you go into Burnley, that opportunity uh, came to me. You get a little bit more wise. You understand your body. You understand when to when to enjoy yourself and when not to. And then it's no coincidence that you you start you start doing better than what you did before. Me in particular, no, I, I was I was um, fully responsible in how just drinking alcohol at long times and. And going out on Tuesday afternoons, and we had the day off on Wednesday. I would never, I would never drink and be under influence at training times, not at all. Right. But it's just it catches up with you, even when you're younger. You think you can get away with it, but performances don't lie. Um, and I take full ownership in that uh, in that situation. And then I think I had three or four managers at Huddersfield as well, which somebody signs you doesn't really go to plan. Another one comes in, they want to bring their own players, which is fully natural for that to happen. And then you find yourself. Needing a new challenge, uh, and thankfully I got the opportunity. I was actually, I actually went on trial to Burnley for a two-week trial. Right. So I, I left uh, Huddersfield, went back into pre-season with Sean Dyche, um, and had to prove my worth. And I had the bit between my teeth. I had the eye of the tiger, and, and thankfully I went there and and managed to gain his trust in uh, pre-season. I think the first season, pretty sure I played 41 out of the 46 games, and then get promoted to the to the Premier League, which is. For a sort of fringe player coming in, then I felt that was a that was a huge honour to play that amount yeah, of games. Great Absolutely, and then you're you back in there. Your contract at Huddersfield. Yeah, yeah, we wrote that out. Yeah. So that must have been a difficult time for you because you finished your contract with Huddersfield, who were in Championship. Yeah. And then you have to go on trial. Was that your first trial since getting into Falkirk? Uh, it was. Yeah, yeah, it was. Then I trialled for Livingston, my, my home team, and I was 13, 14, and never got in, got rejected. So that was that. Uh, and then went to Falkirk, done the same obviously. Uh, Huddersfield signed, had to prove your worth again at, at Burnley. Two promotions and two seasons up to the Premier League. I, a lot of people say that adversity, a lot of players that I've spoken to and even coaches have said that adversity is perhaps one of the most important things yeah. in their career. Would you agree with that well, statement? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Because you have to understand as well, there's particularly at Rangers where the demand at a club that you're playing for is 50. 
55,000 people watching you every second week. There's millions watching on the television. Not every one of them thinks you're good. Not every one of them thinks that you should be playing for that club. Right, right. You know, like you, you right. accept that. And it's up to you to show self-belief and, and complete and utter um, and control your emotions to then prove people wrong. And that's an emotion that I think in, in uh, modern day football, I do think it's going out the game. I, I think everybody wants everything given to them. I don't think they really want to go that extra, that extra yard. And I think in, in time, I think that modern day footballer is, is completely diminishing. I think I was the last sort of that old school mentality, I would say. So I've heard that before, but why, why do you say that about the modern footballers? Is it just your experience with, with younger footballers yeah. now? Well, you've spoke to a few. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put this on me. <laughs> yeah. well, uh, no, absolutely. I just see it. I, just, I think it's a personality thing. Right. Um, I think if you speak to anybody around my age, maybe Westy's a, he's a year or two younger than me. Nathan Byrne, maybe the same. I think maybe they, I say I was the last there. Maybe they two, maybe the 30, right, 32, right. 33. Uh, that age, but it, it certainly, as you can, you can absolutely tell, social media's got a massive thing on it. Obviously, I'm I'm on it, but I'm not as exactly. as trigger happy and as active as the other ones. Happy. I think, That's a very I think the, uh, I'm gonna post think, this exactly, and they need it. They need it for the yeah. sort of thing, you know. And I, and listen, that's that's them. If that's what, if that's their uh, like the difference that they need, then albeit, but you have to accept that sometimes it's not going to go well. You're going right. to get you're going to get the other side yet. And I think that um, it has a massive effect on the modern player than what it did maybe a few years ago. And I guess if the results on, on the pitch are, are good ones, then nobody really cares. It's when things, when things go, uh, yeah. go wrong. I actually asked Dean about this yesterday. We did a, an event uh, and I asked him that question, you know, because he's been coaching for a while and he played in, in the lower divisions, sort of what I call hard man football, yeah. you know. Uh, and his answer was very diplomatic because we're in, audio, in front of an audience of, I think, a, a, a hundred people. So I think that's interesting that you've, you've taken the, con the conversation in that direction. Yeah. I sometimes watch the news or I read an article about a coach who's gotten into trouble for being abusive with, with players. And by abusive, I'm not talking about anything like super egregious, but language. Yeah. Um, and I immediately go back to my days playing academy football in Portugal and just how not terrible, but I guess insensitive my coaches yeah. were. I mean, they would talk to you in a way that was almost dehumanizing. They felt like they were building you up, so obviously there's a limit. But even the things that they would say in the locker room yeah. to players who are about uh, 15 and 16 years old, and that would just would never fly to them, never, never coach never, again. Never, never. And that's the, <clears throat> listen, that, that doesn't mean it's right. It just what ha it's just what happened. Yes. You know yes. what I mean? It was just an acceptance yes. and nobody challenged it. Yes. It doesn't mean it's right. Like I was in, I've seen some stuff in a locker room and I'm thinking, like it wasn't right, it yes. wasn't right back then, like what has been said, what's been done in the locker room, doesn't mean it's correct. What it just means is there was more of acceptance of right. that. But I think like going back to the modern player, I think that's what shows you the sort of the best coaches and the best managers now because you're never going to get the same uh, level of performance if you spoke to them how we used to get spoke to. Right. Because there was an acceptance in that. Now right. you have to, you become a better person and a better coach and manager because you have to relate to them. Right. There has to be a relatedness about that. The so, man-manager side. Absolutely, of the and it's huge. I think it's it's well bigger than any tactics. Any because anybody can look at a a, um, a pitch and move move things in like yeah. mannequins, or you could move, you could pick up the best formation and you could do this. But to tell players in a way that they can understand it, the simplicity, the sort of um, the understanding the game management that that comes from a, a personal thing that's a, that's how you speak to people right. that's just being a good person really and letting the man uh, letting the message land so i think there's far more acceptance in that and i think there's far more importance in that rather than the tactics and motivation as well right players get motivated Huge. by certain coaches a little bit more than of course. others and they get motivated by different things right exactly and, and coaches managers need to tap into those yeah, things. there's 20 there's 25 different players 25 different personalities from t maybe 25 <laughs> different countries there you go you exactly know, yeah uh, different upbringings talk about Huddersfield and the fact that perhaps your professionalism wasn't where it needed to be during your time there yeah. then you go to Burnley you try out it's a success as you said your first season you play f over 40 games which just speaks to the crazy schedule in the championship yeah, yeah. but you're playing for Sean Dyche who's known as a bit of a disciplinarian, right? I mean, is that the correct the perception of him? That's how he comes across, I think, to the media, as somebody who wants things his way and he gets results. 
Yeah, certainly the, the last part. Yeah, it's his way or it's, or it's no way. And I think that's a good thing, but he's got the... I don't think disciplinarian is the right... Um, the right terminology to use. I think he's, um, he's, a, he's, he's a phenomenal man-manager. He got the best out of every single, every single player and 25 different personalities, maybe 10 different nationalities to get them all on the same page. And the budget at that time, I remember seeing it, I think we were third bottom in the budget of the championship and we finished second, I think, just behind Leicester in the first year. And they were far exceeded everything. Yeah. They, go, they go on the next season, or two seasons later, I think, and win the Premier League. So yeah. they, were, they were on their way um, after the takeover. So he was, he was a phenomenal manager. Um, obviously, Ashley had, him, Ashley had him as well. We were at similar times at, at Burnley. So he was a fantastic manager. I, I, phenomenal manager at the time in my career and I completely needed it and completely trusted on him was playing a variety of midfield positions but as long as I was on the pitch he knew exactly what I was, what I was going to give him uh, I could pop up and, and score goals and he completely trusted me to play so many games in and, and the five years that I was with him And what he was able to do with the club in his time there is pretty formidable Yeah, unbelievable To keep them, to keep them with such a low budget to keep them in a the Premier League yeah, as long as he did Yeah, and, and I remember seeing him in interviews at the time and he was saying that they're not going to overspend, he's not going to put the chairman and the owner in a situation where it's going to become another club that you see for, for years and they're always trying to recoup their losses. And right. to, that was never going to happen at Burnley and it stood them in good stead. It uh, allowed them to, to sell the club in for another takeover and obviously you've seen them at this, at this present time, I think. Unfortunately, I think they will, they will just fall short this season. But there's no doubt in the next two or three seasons they'll be, they'll be back where they, where they belong, maybe stronger, they'll sign new players and I think they'll have a better go of it. What do you I think it all starts with, with Sean Dyche and, and Ian Moan. And what he did, because he created the foundation he for where the club it. is he right now. He created it all, yeah. So what do, you, what do you make of of how the club is doing right now and the fact that um, uh, Belgium centre-back, why can't company. I think? Vincent Company has sort of stuck to his tactical guns, has refused to, to change them despite results not going their way. Well, I think you see that, like, it's a modern manager. I don't think you really see anybody coming and completely changing the way. Some would say it's, it's a definition of insanity where you don't get the, the right yeah. results. Maybe you do need to go a little bit different, but if you've worked so hard and you've done a pre-season and you've maybe done four or five years coaching, to then change it, yeah. does it do you lose more than what you've, what you've gained? If you're telling players to do it when your back's against the wall, do you lose more? Or do you die by your sword effectively? Do you just go down and then gather momentum and do it again? But I think the biggest thing you have to see is I think it just shows you the difference and the, the, the sizeable difference there is from the Championship to, to the Premier League because I think Burnley sitting second bottom and it absolutely wiped the floor with it last season in the Championship. Yep. I know Luton's doing, doing particularly well, might, might just have enough to stay up, but the difference in the Championship, the jump, particularly the first season that I came up was, was pretty seismic. It was a, it was a great um, sort of learning curve for these players, the difference in the Championship to there. And the biggest thing is decision making. These players just make the right decisions at the right time, all the time. Would you say that someone once told me that the, the biggest difference between the top quality player and not your average professional, but your good professional, is really decision making more than anything 100%. else? Without a doubt, without a doubt. Because everybody could probably do the same things out with the flair players, out with the, the top, top players. Right. But everybody does the, the same things, but it's how often they do it appreciation at the five yard pass it looks easy but it's not because you've got somebody coming straight in there you need to the appreciation of the pass is to allow you to take that touch forward right so there's there's decision making that makes players move there's decision making that the player will make the player pass there's little things that you see and you you see it more often when you're on the pitch with these players and the cohesiveness with which you you, you move as well as it, it, it is something that i think is super important but yeah. you mentioned luton for example now playing in the premier league and, and doing relatively well. A lot of people expected them, especially the way they yeah. started, that they'd be rock bottom. Yeah. What's interesting about them is they've sort of stayed true to a more defensive and transitional game. And it goes back to what Vincent Company is doing. And then if you sort of compare Company with, with someone like Daesh, I mean, those t two types of football are it's completely different. diametrically yeah, opposed. Yeah, completely different. I think we were more suited. We, we, we were suited in the, in the championship playing that system. And I think to even, you know, exaggerate our movements going into the Premier League would have been, we would have just got popped off. Right. We got relegated maybe, maybe three or four games to go in the in the first season, 
went back to the championship, won the championship that, that season and, and continued to do the same, but just signed a better calibre of player. The calibre of player just kept on coming up. Um, but the, the system was the same, the movements were the same, everything yep. was the same. But when you've played with the same system for so long, you know it just... It's automatic. It's automatic. It's absolutely automatic. Before we move on, and I want to talk about Old Firm, um, was there a player when you were playing in the Premiership <clears throat> that you played against and you were like, oh my God, this guy is just out of his world? Yeah, there was oh, so many. We'd be here. We'd be here. There was uh, Hazard, Hazard on his time, because I was playing wide at the time uh, at Stamford Bridge. Hazard's performance was just... He was it was ridiculous. prime hazard. It was prime. And yeah. uh, it was absolutely. It had me and uh, Kieran Trippier just jumping into the stands. He was just absolutely <laughs> just chopping the life out of us. Um, and Alexis Sanchez. I remember, like, the one thing that I remember about Alexis Sanchez, we played Arsenal at, at home. And I think he just signed, maybe it was his first season. And the amount, of, the amount because we always had the data in terms of your sprints and yeah. uh, di distance covered and stuff. He was on top of everything. I think he scored that night, maybe he scored two. But I remember there was just, that was that was the standard of the player. He was incredible on the ball, but he was even better off the ball. Right. And it was it was just this full, you know, the guy was on so much money a week, but the hunger was as if he's not got anything. The yeah. hunger was just to, to be the best player all the time, on and off the pitch. And that was the one thing that I kept on looking at, just thinking that's the difference here. A proper Premier League player, a superstar. Than just a, just an average player. And the lifestyle outside of, of football as well, right? Making sure that you're doing everything right. All right, let's let's fast forward to to Scotland. You you grow up in you grow up in Scotland. You grow up in Falkirk. Obviously, Old Firm is big for you, even just as as a fan. You're watching the games between Celtic and Rangers, Rangers and and, and Celtic. You get an opportunity to go uh, to Rangers. I don't think most soccer fans in this country, and I would say in many other places. Don't quite understand the animosity that exists between the two clubs that is rooted in a, in a lot of history. Yeah. What was your experience like? How much of a change was it psychologically for you to go from somewhere like Burnley, where there are lots of expectations, of course, but then to move to arguably the biggest club in Scotland and one of the greatest in, in Great Britain? Yeah, the biggest thing, I've spoken about this in numerous, numerous times. You know how big the two clubs are, but you don't know how big they are until you go and you're a player. Because you carry the badge everywhere you go for the next, I was there for five seasons. You drop the kids at nursery, you're carrying the badge. Everybody wants a bit of you, everybody wants to punch you, or everybody wants to cuddle and kiss you. That is what Glasgow is. So you don't understand how big it is and how many people you can reach for. Just a game, again, a, a normal Saturday game, there's millions of people watching that. You score, you hear about it, you have a bad performance, you hear about it, there's no escapism. And, and the biggest thing is, everybody, when, I, when I signed, everybody around me, my closest, my, my nearest and dearest, all signed for Rangers also, because their life gets affected by this. Right, it's an, it's, that's an interesting point. It's an incredible, incredible football club. Um, extremely lucky that I was ever part of it for 10 games, never mind over 150 games. It was, it was unbelievable experiences. The only thing, obviously, you want to win, win more trophies and have more things to look back on. Um, but there's so many memories along the way that you know, you're, you're part of that historical, historical football club, and yeah, extremely, extremely lucky and uh, and blessed to be, to be a part of that, to look back on. So, so did you have any semblance of a private life, like, or, or just could oh, within, you? Within reason, within reason, you could, but it was like, yeah, it was just the most normal things just wasn't a normal thing. Like it, going to the supermarket. Yeah, like I remember dropping the kids at nursery. That I mean, some of the nursery teachers are Celtic Rangers fans, so. They want to talk about the game and you've played bad or you've lost in a Saturday. Or they're not educating your kids properly. Well, <laughs> exactly. Um, teacher's night became a bit of a mission as well. So, But there was loads of, there was loads of scenarios where you just, you just could, not, you could not escape it because everybody wants to talk yeah. about it. You, you, you draw a game, you don't leave the house for three or four days because yeah. you just can't. Obviously, you go to training, you come back, the wife has to go and do something, the kids go and do something, but you stay in. If you lose a game, it's, you, you're not leaving the house for two weeks. So it, it's incredible, and then if you, you win, it's more a, a, a relief that you can actually go and do things. But but it's a bit for me. For me, there's there's no even a comparison. It's the biggest game in, in the world. I mean, the little man that just walked back there, the L, He's he was new to it in the last two or three seasons, and we spoke about it here. It's it's just an, a phenomenal football game. When he did his introductory press conference, somebody asked him if you guys had, had spoken, and he had this sort of. Uh, sneaky smile on his face and said no, but he suggested 
besides, you know, the abusive language that yeah. you direct at, at, at each other. <laughs> I'm sure you remember playing against him pretty well, yeah. and he remembers playing against you. What was that like, and how is it? What's it like now? Yeah, he, he was away. I'm not just saying this because he signed, but I said this when I heard that there was interest in him. He was a one wing, and they had they had fantastic team Celtic um, under Poster Coglu. They really did. They had phenomenal football players, but he was a one the one winger that you just didn't want to play with. He pops up with so many goals and, and so many big moments for uh, for Celtic, and just crashing the back post. So if he gets anywhere near the form and a Charlotte shot that he did in Celtic, then I'm sure the fans are going to really take to him. Well, that's 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 great to uh, to hear. There there are a couple of other things that I wanted to ask you about Old Firm, but I'm also mindful of, mindful of your time. But you you've mentioned outsides, you know, the football pitch and the way that game affected your life. When you walk out onto the field, and that's the game. Is it's not just another it's not just another game, right? This is a very special event. But for you, in terms of preparation, do you need to do anything differently to to, to really prepare yourself for what you're about to face for the next 90 minutes? No, I try to in the first couple to try and stay off your phone and stop talking to people. But everybody, it's it's unavoidable. So you, you, normally, and throughout my career, you, I don't think about the game. But like even the game in, in Saturday, I won't think of. Obviously, you do your preparation and you're, you're aware of players, but in terms of actually thinking about the game against Toronto on Saturday, there's very limited time that I'll actually think about that game because I think your, your nervous energy just overtakes you. Right. And as you get older, you realise that these are wee things that can, can make you more fatigued in the game going forward. So as soon as, uh, as, soon as the whistle blows, then you're on it. But I, I like to not think about it. But this game is sometimes you, it's, it's unavoidable. You're right. thinking about it, it just pops up different things. and. Uh, most of my mates are Rangers fans, some of my mates are Celtic fans, so it's just, you're just, you're in there. So it's all about, because you're in, you're in, well, of those. course, you're in, you're in group chats and everybody's sending things in, so it's a, it's a phenomenal game, as it really is. I'm so lucky I've been part of it for many years. I, I remember, you know, in my formative years, old firm games were, were quite big for me, and I, I remember one weekend in particular, uh, it was, you know, Celtic Rangers, Pierre Van Hooydonk was playing for, for Celtic at the time, and he had a, Sorry to say this. He had a great game for he had a great game for Celtic, and uh, that same weekend, Liverpool beat Newcastle four three. And I remember that weekend alone. When I when I think back to the most impactful weekends of football that I've seen, What's that was one of them because it was amazing. That. Is that Keegan over the advertising board, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah. Stan, Stan Collymore scored. Yeah, was it a hat trick yeah. or two yeah. goals? Yeah, yeah I that was a great yeah. game. That was a proper game. Uh, sure. Peter Beardsley. Espria. Espria Espr Espr was, yeah. yeah. I mean, that was, the, those two teams. Nostalgic. Were, right? Nostalgic. That was proper football, wasn't it? It was. It was. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that I grew up watching sort of 90s football. Yeah, for so me, for me, it was, it was big. And when so I think about the old, old firm, I think, obviously, people like Pierre van Hooydonk for Celtic. I think of Henrik Larsson. I think yeah. of Barry Ferguson yeah, for, for you guys. Yeah. Jan Malby. Yeah. Um, who else? Two giant Gaza. teams, wasn't it? Yeah, it's just, just big names yeah, that were involved involved with it. Uh, international football. You played youth for, for Scotland, yeah. but then you get an opportunity. 2016 was it? 2016. To to play for for Canada. How did that come about? And was it an easy decision for you to make that one time switch? It was. It was going forward. Yeah, I was playing. <clears throat> I think I was. I think it was the season we got back. Back into the Premier League. So I was. I was doing well in the Championship. There was a. Um, the last international, which would have been in November, the FIFA international. <coughs> I was thinking I was going to get called up to Scotland um, at that time, but at, at the time, to be honest, there was there was maybe ten players that could play in centre mid for for Scotland. They had a very strong team at that time, uh, and then I spoke to the the manager Sean Dyson and then spoke to the Scotland manager Gordon Strachan and basically just reiterated that I'm I'm well down in the pecking order in this uh, campaign going forward. So then I just started. Um, Looking at different avenues, my, my dad was born in Toronto. He always says to me, says, as a kid, I would love you to play for play for Canada, but obviously, born and raised in Scotland, just thinking that that's going to be that's going to be the the route that you go down. Then it more got to that, and I was I was just needing a, an injection in terms of I just wanted to sense this international football. What is it? Uh, and at the time, I was playing with a boy called uh, David Edgar, who was Canadian at, at Burnley, great lad, and we were at one of the boys. Uh, birthday parties and I just said to him, my dad was born in Toronto, just in, I hadn't in even passing, said, yeah, right. just in passing, I think it was like two in the morning or something, and he got the, the CEO of a Canadian association, Morgan, he got him on the phone that night, 
and then in the March I was playing against Mexico at BC Place in, in Vancouver, so it, it just went. It just That's went quite like a trip that. as well. It's quite a trip. That was my first one. The weather not uh, too different though and between was, Scotland and <laughs> Vancouver. <laughs> and it was, uh, but it was amazing, and I wouldn't have changed it again. That yeah. was that was the route that went down it, and I absolutely loved it. Loved it. Loved the manager that I played with. Loved seeing this side of the world. John Herdman. Yeah. <clears throat> at the time we had uh, Michael Finlay, we had um, Octavio, um, we had I think four or five different managers and then John came in and, and steadied the ship and you could see what was going to happen, happened, the 2000 and uh, what would that have been, 2022, was it 22? Something, yeah, uh, thereabouts, because yeah, he was, yeah, it, it, you mean in the, uh, in the World Cup, World just Cup. so you knew, you knew it was going to, it was just going to take that turn, he was, he was definitely going to get it to where it was going to go. Um, so yeah, that was right at the start of that campaign. Uh, he done a phenomenal job going forward, and yeah, I've just just absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it, seeing this side of it, and this is what really appetite uh, whetted my appetite for for the MLS because all the players played in the MLS at this time, and I was intrigued and fascinated oh, nice. about this time. So I think a large part of me sat here today was back in 2016, 2018, talking to these players and seeing this side. Of it. it was always something I wanted to do. It's amazing how, you know, somebody's career, the career, this is why I wanted to talk to you, because your career arc and the way you've, you've gone about going to different teams and how you've ended here is, is, is really interesting. Yeah. I was going to ask you something about, you know, the Europa League final, but, you know, time has sort of wound down, because not only did you play under the pressure of, of an old firm, Derby, but you've yeah. taken a penalty in a final that you made. Yeah. Uh, so I guess I will ask you. It was a cracker you. as well. Top, top corner. It was a cracker. Yeah, yeah I, I, remember, I remember that game Some well. Goal. The environment in Sevilla was yeah, crazy in that. It was. Yeah, okay. it was. Um, but that's what I mean. Like you're, you're sat with a, with a silver medal and for one penalty kick. Yeah. You know, it could have been anybody that missed it. Yeah. Aaron, 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 Ramsey. Aaron misses it. But you know, it could have been anybody that missed it. It could have been a Frankfurt player or whatever. But the run to the full... You know, we overachieved, there's absolutely no doubt about that. There's far better football teams in that competition than, <coughs> than us getting to Seville, um, putting out the likes of um, Borussia Dortmund and, and Leipzig in particular is far exceeding, but just shows you what togetherness, a, a stadium, a, uh, an environment, an atmosphere can, can really do. It spooks the, spooks the best. And yeah, I, thought, I felt as if we were at it. And we, really did, we really did deserve to be there in the end. And as I say, it's one penalty kick away from, from being a winner. But... I mean, it, it was, was a tightly contested honor. game. Yeah, it was, yeah. That, that had game a, was had a big patient. chance, Ryan. Ryan Kent had a, a chance right at the end of the extra time as well to put it in. Yeah. Keeper does a good save, so... Yeah, it's one of them, but you've, you've been there, you've played in the final. It's, it could have been better, but... But at least you were there. There's better players than me that's never played in the final. That's, 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 sure. that's, that's true. That's how I look at it. That's true. Very quickly on Steven Gerrard, because, you know, you won a, a Scottish Premiership with him, you oh, got yeah. to the final with him. What's it like being coached by one of the guys who's considered one of the greatest players in the Premier League? Well, he was he was my hero, Steven Gerrard. He was, as soon as he came into the club, he had that aura, he had that, when you heard that I signed for Rangers two weeks before and, and he had a whisper from the CEO who signed me <coughs> that Steven was going to come in and I was so excited and obviously he phones me just before it gets announced. And your excitement levels through the door and then... The first season we just felt short, second season was COVID and then the third season we knew we were going to do it. He's just had this amazing order. His staff was absolutely fantastic and we, we managed to win the, win the big one, the 55th title with Rangers. And yeah, phenomenal man, still speak to him um, and really, really enjoyed him. Second best paid coach in, the, in world football right now after Diego Simeone. Simeone, Dean, see Dean, Smith, Dean Smith told me that. I knew about Diego Simeone being the best paid. Right. But he asked me yesterday. Who's who number you? three, Dean Smith? <laughs> <laughs> who, knows? Who, knows? who knows? Who knows? Hey, man, I really appreciate your time. Oh, I know we went a little bit long. There were some microphone issues, but I, I, I think we're going to find a way to put that in there because that, that was gold. Nice one, mate. Thanks so much. Pleasure, man. mate. All the hey, best to you. Good to talk to you. Cheers, mate.